cool with it we'll just kick it off and we'll just go um sure. so, so here we are uh I wanted to I wanted to start off this podcast different than any other podcast because for me this is actually really different and I say different because um for those of you listening uh and Dave feel free to jump in here but I've connected with Dave a handful of times through social media and been following uh Dave's podcast which we'll talk about and so much of what you offer it it speaks my language but at the same time it challenges me and I want to start this podcast off with a quote and to see where that took us and the reason I say it's different is because I don't feel like I've had a guest on this show that is truly and this is me just projecting a bit but truly open to the idea of like hey what do you think about quotes and do you want to talk about quotes but I, I know that sorry I think that this quote is something that you've either heard or you've even spoke yourself in your podcast. And I wanted to unpack it a bit with you and let that be kind of the fuel to move us forward. So the quote is, uh, if you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid. So I'm going to pause myself and allow you to kind of touch base on that Epictetus quote, what it means to you, how it resonates and how it shows up. And then I'll all share why, for me, it was important at this moment on this podcast to bring that quote of all of those quotes that he shares up with you. So what, what does that, what do those words uh, do to you, for you, et cetera? Can you do me a solid and just say it one more time for me? Yeah, absolutely. If you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid. Mm. Cool. Beautiful, huh? Yeah, I love it. I mean, there's, there's multiple different ways to sort of look at this and unpack it. Uh, and my, my offer for anyone to do that with quotes and it's something that I really enjoy doing anyway um, for anyone that has listened to any of the content that I put out in the past. But something like this is, is it's, it's pointing at the continual, um, I'll use the word desire of improvement that individuals may have. And anyone listening to a podcast, anyone wanting to progress in their career, anyone wanting to be a better mother, a better father, a better uncle is going to have that desire on some degree. We've got to be careful with the word desire though, because desire often keeps us unhappy. But let's use that as in um, more of a, uh, a value of improvement rather than something that we, we don't have. Keep in mind, improve means I prove. But <laughs> outside of that, it, the couple of things that, that really strike strike me and reach out to me is be um, you may hear barking in the background and that'll be my yeah. little mini schnauzer that'll be Petey <laughs> yeah. playing guard at the gym um, the this contentness of being perceived to be foolish or, or stupid or what other terminology you use yeah. there so there's two things going on there. Hey, and so what is what what that quote's offering is the internal authority to be content regardless of what other people may think of you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the things that can often um, stop people in their tracks of their own developing and unfolding is, uh, and this is my experience. This is my experience with working with fucking thousands of people. Um, is this concern over what other people may think for them so it's the it goes back to the other quote of i'm not who i think i am i'm not who you think i am i am who i think you think i am Uh and um when we can sort of allow people to choose how they see us because a different version of us exists in everyone's mind we allow ourselves to show up simultaneously and so that's where improvements already occurring, but it's actually no longer improvement. It's simply just the unfolding. Right. Um, and that's beautiful in, in my perception. Yeah. And I, and I agree. And the reason I chose that one quote is because currently like right now it's very apropos for me because I'm at a time in my life where I'm witnessing a lot of changes. Um, and through those changes, I feel, but also in fielding, like people are actually articulating to me that are in my circle um, concerns or they're 
my interpretation is they're projecting their uh, values onto me. So how do you navigate, how do you personally navigate that? Or how would you work with someone through that when it's not just a passerby? It's not just uh, someone that you uh, maybe don't care deeply about or don't have a relationship about that is, that is thinking you foolish or thinking you stupid. It's someone who is near and dear to you. How does that, or I guess the question is like, how do you rise above that? Or how do you allow, like, how do you stay the course when it's someone that you care so deeply for, but then they're questioning or challenging your values and projecting theirs onto you? Um, it'd be different for each person, right? And it's, 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 it's a really good question because a lot of people do struggle with this. My, my personal perception of how I would deal with this situation compared to how multiple other people deal with this situation varies in, in, in drastic measurements. Right. So the more often than not, a lot of the people that are close to you, um, and not the people that are actually in your corner for your development. And so one of the reasons for that is because if they like their map of their reality, and that means that you behave a particular way, then when you decide to, to develop and, and a part of you dies in order for a new part of you to grow, that's actually interfering with their map of reality. And so it's much easier to do the projection thing that you spoke about. Um, and, um, and keep that person behaving in a particular way that helps your map, regardless of, of what they may look like. Mm. And so we then have to be careful of then projecting our values and our map onto that person. So if we're going through, let's call it a stage of growth, excuse me, where we're going through changes and we're, we're, we're challenging our own status quo and these people around us aren't, then allowing them not to, or allowing them to do whatever the fuck they're doing anyway, is one of the most powerful things we can do for them and for us. When we then either go back to, let's call it our default, or we expect them to grow with us, that's a projection of our values as well. Right. And so the key thing there is, is every single human being is, is unfolding at, at their own rate, their own pace. There's, there's, no, there's no timeline, there's no finish line, right? None of that actually exists. And so throughout your own, and let me explain unfolding a little bit more. So um, it'll give a bit more, I suppose, scope to it. When I, when I use the word unfolding, I mean, you meeting yourself on a deeper level without the personality structures, without the defenses, not, not as in you've got rid of them, but you've actually learned to know them intimately. Because mm. when, we, when we try and change something we don't like about ourselves, it's just the same. It's rejection. Uh, as opposed to integration. And so um, as we unfold and we actually, re it's called the homecoming, right? When we return right. home. Yeah. Um, and I spoke about it on one of my podcasts this week. Um, then we, we simultaneously, uh, as we grow, we, we stop. There comes a point where we stop the need in thinking other people have to do the same, how we perceive growth. And so that's where we have to be very careful ourselves being like that person needs to fucking stop projecting. Whereas that's us projecting our values into them that they need to stop projecting. Right. And so it's, it's a really ironic projection of values. Um, just ours are better. Right. And yeah. so that's one of the challenges of it. And it becomes that, you know, I'm full of quotes just so you know, I think I've read enough to fucking store. Yeah, no. And that's, and that's what I'm saying. Like, that's why I, I do appreciate and I have appreciated for years, your content because it, the quotes for me, I just, I read a quote and I, I look at it as I'm assuming you do. Like you, you, you see it for more than the words. And I know people, I know friends of mine that are really near and dear friends. They just hold no value of quotes and that's totally okay. Um, sure. Yeah. But for me, like I, I really do. I feel like it's, I feel like they're breadcrumbs left by these people that we can, we can all learn from. Uh, some, a word, a word that you use that, um, that I feel like comes up a ton nowadays and we're seeing it with coaches and, um, life coaches and business coaches and coaches in the gym, et cetera, is growth. And I know that for a lot of people, the idea of growth is, um, is rejected. They don't want to grow. They're totally cool with where they're at. 
And this for me came up just yesterday. I was listening to Esther Perel speak and she said something that really struck home for me. And she said, I'm paraphrasing here. Of course, she said, uh, in business or in life, like individually or in relationships, if we don't grow, we fossilize and we die. But then there's the other extreme where if we change too much too soon, it becomes chaotic and we dysregulate. Do you agree, disagree? Are you in full support of that? And then if so, how do you, how do you work with people that don't want to grow? It isn't their knee jerk reaction to seek growth. Let's start with the first part. I'm, I'm not sure that all those different types of coaches that you mentioned would use growth in the same way. True. And I, I, I wouldn't project once again to know what they actually mean by it. So growth mm -hmm. to me is, is a different term to what a business coach may use growth for. And a, a younger business coach compared to an older business coach is going to use growth and, and mean different things again. Mm -hmm. And so this is where semantics becomes really, really, really crucial, right? And once again, need to be very mindful of how much and this is the the introspection and the self-reflection or the putting it out for review however you want to um how, whatever <laughs> semantics you want to use to yeah. explain it yeah. um allows us to to see our own growth and understand what that actually means for us and so there's there's many variations of growth um but with that with that introspection we then have the opportunity to see how much um we're then projecting our values onto other people that they should grow based upon what we deem growth to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where, and if you go back to, um, I'm not sure if you ever listened to it, it's actually my second mood prep before it was the Alpha Theta Flow podcast. Right. It was mood prep. Um, and so that's 620 odd episodes ago. The second podcast there a number of years ago was called Unbecome What You're Not. Uh -huh. yeah, I love that. And so a, a lot of people, uh, in my experience, when thinking growth, think, you know, more weight on the bar, um, lose weight, and then I'll sustain it or something like that as if as if these things equal the fulfillment that they're seeking. Right. Um, and so that particular type of growth has an end date. Mm -hmm. And so what's also encouraging that growth is often the personality structures that they're upholding because of their childhood and because of their experiences in life. Right. And so growth can, can mean many different, like think of it more like a psychograph rather than simply a, a, a just one graph of line, a, a, right. a, a line graph. And so the, the way to then see it is that like, what, what are the structures within us that are actually holding us back that we value because they were useful at some point in our life, right? Could be jealousy. It could be, could be, uh, it could be achievement. I know people that continually achieve that are fucking miserable. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they're still seeking to, you know, please their father or something, some sort of arbitrary, I'm, I'm really generalizing it, but in yeah. doing so, they're continually seeking this, this never ending, unfulfilling growth. And the problem is, is that, that that's unless there's a lesson at the end, when you get to the, you know, the, the little door at the back of the chocolate factory and realize that that's it there's nothing else here for you that's going to make you happy or fulfilled. Um, you got to turn around and find out who you actually are and unbecome all the bullshit that you, you, you're not. Yeah. And so in doing so growth has this, this multifaceted meaning as mm. opposed to um, just a commercial sense or just a, right. a physical sense or um, a, a maturity sense. We can, we can take this multifaceted meaning because we're not then relying on other people to get results for me to feel growth. I'm then not relying on the market to act a particular way for me to feel growth. I'm actually able to define growth as it is for me as a human being interacting with the world around me. Yeah. And, um, and so that's where if I worked with somebody that just was not interested at all in any of that, um, that's fine. Carry on. I, I don't need to uh, it's like, well, shouldn't you be motivating me to do that? Cause that's what they all sound like apparently. Right. And I'm like, no, it's like, if that's, if, fuck, if, if you, if you, if you're fine with where you're at, then just be where you're at. Mm -hmm. You might be a little bit annoyed at it, but if that's not enough, then don't worry about it. Something, something will happen and you'll get annoyed enough to, and, and you'll get frustrated and in enough pain to change and, and so be it. Um, or it won't. Why, who am I to say that that's, that's right either way. Um, 
And then I choose, you mentioned before, around families and friends in a circle. Mm. Uh, I choose then how much I interact with those people, not in the sense of like, I'm not going to spend time with them because they're not into growth because that's right. not me growing. That's right. complete fucking judgment, yeah. right? And yeah. so and so it's just a matter of going, well, what, what's important for me and what's 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 going to aid my unfolding and and if those people ever ever need me then i'm going to be right here my love for them doesn't change the beers yeah. that i have with them on a thursday night on a school night might you know as an example yeah yeah i thought that's something for me that a while ago i was really challenged by was i'd almost like envision this um like me embodying almost like this Gandhi essence when I was ever, you know, challenged by that challenged by other people's values. But like, to your point, like that's if, if they don't want to grow and I do, and I then project that onto them, or then I feel a certain way about them. That isn't me growing. I'm limiting myself. But at what point do you, or uh, hypothetically speaking, others, at what point, do we choose, and I guess this comes down to values, but I'd love to get your in, your input on this. Like, what hills do you define that you're willing to die on? And what do you say, like, enough is enough. I can't be doing this anymore. Or is it never that way? Do, do we constantly just flow with life? And that is the, that ultimate level of unconditional love, if you will, where it's just like, I'm here and that's it. Or are there those times you're just like, sorry, dude, like I'm not going to stay out till 3 a.m. drinking beers on Thursday night with you anymore because X. Yeah. And I, that, let's, let's talk to the last one there. The, there absolutely is those points. And usually it's a conversation with yourself, right? But um, that, that's simply a, a, a safe and healthy boundary. Right. Based upon your, your true north. And so that safe and healthy boundary is, is absolutely crucial for, for multiple reasons. And the two main ones is so that you yourself have a boundary, but so for the people around you have a boundary as well. And some people struggle with boundaries. They absolutely struggle with boundaries. And they're often the ones that are concerned, often generalizing, but often the ones that are concerned about what other people may think of them. And so that's where the, 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 the work, the inner work, and it is inner work, um, it's not face what's in front of you, face what's within you. So when something in front of you triggers something, that actual something that's triggered is within you. So what's going on there rather than changing the thing in front of you? Um, because that's, it's, it's basically being under responsible for your own reactions, re actioning a behavior or a response to a situation being under responsible that, and then, and then pushing that onto somebody else saying, well, you need to change. This doesn't occur in me again. And we, we can't go around the world and tell the world not to do that. Mm. It's that's exhausting. And so, you know, we, we, everything in life is hard. We get to choose our hard. And so one of the hardest things to do is to go in and, and why is this triggering me? But to the point around boundaries, that's, that's an absolute skill. Um, and usually an, it's an interpersonal skill. We may think it's intrapersonal. It is both. Um, sorry, other way around. It's, it's intrapersonal, interpersonal, because the, the reason why we may not set boundaries is heavily based off intrapersonal values or, or belief structures or meanings or whatever the case might be. Frames is what I refer to it as. Um, and then we struggle to then put boundaries in our inter relationships, interpersonal relationships, but we think it may be interpersonal in between all our friends or family. And I struggle to put boundaries to them. So it must be to do with them but it's to do with our own meaning structures and everything. So that's where it's going within. Like, why do I struggle with that? What's that on behalf of? Um, what would life be like if I had healthy boundaries? What would a healthy, what, what could a healthy boundary look like? Where in my life I holding myself and, and others back by not setting healthy boundaries. Um, and so it's, it's these types of questions and, and things that are worth asking, but you've got to be able to ask these questions, wanting to know the answer if we simply ask a question and then, then judge the answer that comes up for us that arises, then usually it's our own, it's our own judgment of the situation. And then we're judging our judgment of the situation. Right. right. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's quite funny. It's like it, working with yeah. people and being like pointing something out about their judgment, not as in like, it's bad. Just like, can you see that? They're like, Oh fuck. 
oh, that's so bad. <laughs> I'm like, can you see you judge your judgment? Yeah. Do you find this as funny as me or is it just me? And that's something I find really interesting about philosophy is – is that is like I and I've heard you say on the podcast uh, when it was mood prep, you would say things like that, like you're judging the judgment, and it's just like a, a snake eating its own tail kind of thing. It's just like this perpetual thing. So for you and the work that you do with your clients, let's talk about clients outside of the gym. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you? How do I say this? How do you go from that? philosophical uh i'll say jargon for lack of a better term but philosophical like judging the judgment when i'm assuming you you want to because of who you are and i'm sure your clients do because of why they've come to you achieve something whether it is unbecoming who they are not or growing as in terms of like you know that y-axis and x-axis x-axis and like the the lines going up how do we get there if it seems to be just this circle or is that that is life it is just a circle does that make sense i'm not sure i fully understand the question so like how do we get how do we get an end result if right. we're all if we're always just asking questions i guess is like the most broad way to ask the question how do we get a result when we're always asking questions well you definitely want more questions than answers um you gotta be wh- very why careful is, with why is that sorry you gotta be careful of the person that has more answers than questions <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very careful um so the your brain's like google when we ask a question we're going to have responses show up and so the right. quality of our questions that we ask which becomes a skill over time anyway and and there's a lot of self-awareness that that comes with that because we we ask ourselves questions all day it's like oh, fuck, why did i do that again small example that we may not even be, be aware of um, in our day-to-day life. I can always do that. Why do I always do that? Um, even, even other things such as like, Oh, I don't think I can do that. And that may not show up like that. It may show up like I'll just get this weight in the gym again, or I'll just, um, I won't uh, go for that promotion because I didn't get it last time, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so the quality of our questions actually help navigate the quality of our life. Um, but the big difference there is, is, is asking questions consciously versus what comes up unconsciously, um, or some people may say subconsciously. So the, the skill of, of asking quality questions, both as the individual wanting to, to navigate their mind, um, uh, and get a clear understanding of what's going on is really, really important. And then the skill of asking questions are from a, a coaching perspective because that's what coaching is coaching is is literally facilitating the, these conversations that um uphold the client as an expert in their matter uh and what that means is that they may not consciously know why they let's say self-sabotage mm. but if we learn to ask the right questions we can start to see particular patterns that show up for them and then simply point at it and go well is that true for you does that land for you is that a pattern for you and so it's just a matter of going, you know, reverse engineering that and be like, so, so what's, what's the question you have? What's the inquiry? What's the outcome that you want? And then let, let's go from there. And so from there, from my coaching perspective, the work that I do, the developmental work that I do, the type of practices that I offer people um, aren't just um, practices of mind. It takes an integrative approach. So it looks at different forms of the physical body of groups, of communities, of, of, um, let's call it mindfulness, although that's kind of the opposite of what you want to do. You don't want to fill the mind. The whole point of it is to emptying it, right. observing it. But um, so that's where those conversations allow us to not see the person in front of us as, so I'll expand on a bit more, but not just as an object of information, mm-hmm. but a subject of communication or a subject of interpretation. interpretation. Right. And so when we take an integrative approach, we do both. Um, In the book that I'm reading at the moment called um, The Body Keeps the Score by a guy called Bessel. I can't remember his surname. Ben de Klock, I think. Um, When he was a a young intern as um, a uh, not a psychologist, psychiatrist, psychiatrist, um, and he was there and he was speaking to the 
the doctor he was doing his interning with and he um, looked at all the symptoms of the patient in front of him. Now at this, at this particular um, institute, they encourage the interns to not read from the textbooks for the first year, no reading from the textbooks. Oh. Right. And uh, so he was looking at this patient, looking at all the symptoms and then he goes to the doctor and says, um, what would you call this patient? And the doctor thinks for a second and goes, I think I'll call him Mark Taylor. <laughs> That's his name. Why, why like, <laughs> it's this thing where we, we, this beautiful thing where we have the opportunity once again to meet ourselves and, and to treat the person, the whole person in front of us, mm -hmm. not just as the objects of information that I have on this page about their fucking chemical imbalances or whatever, not just the subjects of, of interpretation or communication where we start to, to see the frames of mind or see the, the structures of mind, but see the whole person. And so that's really what we're coaching to. Yeah. And that's actually really well put from a question that was pretty chopped up. So I appreciate the way you handled that. And as you were speaking, it reminded me of, do you know the name, uh, uh, Gabor Mate, Dr. Gabor Mate? It doesn't come to mind. No. So he's, I'll send you, I'll send you some of his stuff. I think he would really, really appreciate it. He practiced a lot of his medicine in actually in Vancouver, uh, BC. Um, but his story is amazing. And, and one thing he shares, he actually shared it on the Tim Ferriss podcast was he believes in fully, uh, he dealt he dealt with a lot of the uh, mental illness that is prevalent in uh, Vancouver, BC, and that mental illness uh, then motivates a lot of uh, drug and alcohol abuse, um, overdoses, etc. But what he said is what he's learned through his practice is you don't want to treat the 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 addiction. What you want to treat is what's causing the addiction, and mm -hmm. I think so many of us, and I know myself, I've been guilty of this as well of and i think this may i think this may be like a male thing and i'd love to get your take on this but it's like we just want to fix things we see something that's not working or broken or incorrect is the way the way we see it and we want to just innately fix it but it isn't it isn't the addiction that needs to be fixed like you said it's that like the kid it's the way that kid interact with the parents it's that like 12 year old or 8 year old inside of you can you expand on that a bit more and how you see that about not treating the actual, like it's not the weight you want to lose, for example. Mm, yeah. It's, it's what's causing you to gain that weight that you quote unquote don't want. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two, two things to that. The first one, um, I think recently Oregon legalized like a I lot of, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, like, um, not what's known as illicit drugs. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly what drugs, meth, maybe something like that. I can't, can't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. I didn't think too much of it. I was just like, you know, <laughs> Oregon being Oregon. Um, and then uh, I saw another post later on that one of the core, I don't know how true this is, but I think it's, it's quite a, a beautiful thought. Um, one of the core reasons why they did that was so that uh, addicts wouldn't go to jail. They would go to rehab. Yeah. And so if they legalize it, then it wasn't that it was legal everyone do it it was actually that well it's not illegal for this person to do it anymore but if they need a change they're not going to they're not going to go to jail and and have this horrible experience that's right. never going to actually um help help find a solution for the individual they're actually going to go to rehab and so i'm like oh that's that makes a lot of sense and it's, it's a great way to deal with something downstream or technically upstream for downstream mm -hmm. uh, depending how you want to look at it so so that was really really powerful um in my book, I spoke about um, conversations I've had with clients. And I remember one client where in a conversation uh, and she wasn't aware of this until our conversation uh, around weight loss um, was that uh, she, she used to be in an abusive relationship. And so um, one of the ways for her to not be um, not, not be abused, physically abused is to not be attractive to men. Hmm. Right. And so, so that's where it's like, ha you don't, you don't write a diet for that, but this is what's really interesting. And, and I just read about it through, um, the body keeps the score. Cause I actually got talk about the same thing, which I was like, Oh, great. This is, this is a little bit more depth around exactly what I've experienced and what I've, I've spoken about because what the core of, of, our coaching and training should look like is is helping that person 
get to where they want to go and, and experience more of life, how they want to experience it. Hence the state of flow rather than going, we're going to help you lose weight or we're going to get you strong or we're going to tone you up as if that's like, that's, that's the flower. It's not the fucking cake. So mm-hmm. let's talk about the cake. Like what is it that you want? That's the cake. And then we'll figure out the ingredients. And so, um, her, what I might look at potentially, um, as the, problem being overweight eating too much is actually that person's solution right yeah and so not only do they may already may already feel ashamed about being overweight but it's significantly better than being beaten right Mm -hmm. not only that the thing is is that now their solution isn't good enough because i think they should lose weight so this is like we got to fucking meet the person we and that that takes time and 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 that's okay Mm -hmm. um because that time's going to pass anyway but the key thing there is when we see the whole person and we're able to be able to coach that be able to communicate with that be able to literally accept that right because development comes from feedback love and education and when i say love there's there's two types of it one's self-love and the other one's compassion and self-love is 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 the lower reaching to the higher saying i'm i'm good enough to grow um and i deserve it and compassion is the higher reaching down to the lower and that doesn't mean trainer at the top client at the bottom that literally means moving through codependent pat- patterns into dependency independency and interdependency mm-hmm. so there's this this beautiful thing there that that every single one of us have an opportunity to and and we can only ever meet someone as deep as we meet ourselves and so the more opportunities we give ourselves to do that, the more that we actually get to, and like in your industry, you're actually serving like a group of individuals. You're not, not serving a a table. You're not, that's not, you're not, the table's not eating the fucking food, Mm -hmm. right? A group of individuals are eating that food. Mm -hmm. And, and when we can, when we can serve that, that's now we're in the people industry. We're no longer in hospitality or fitness or whatever. Yeah. And so that, that's, that's a beautiful place to be. Yeah. I think that's like, that's, the ultimate i think um and speaking to that story what comes up for me in the story in regards to the client that you had and she was overweight and had that terrible experience in regards to physical abuse it reminds me a bit of um or it reminded me as you were just talking about it that uh the human flaw that tony robbins shares in awaken the giant within he talks about the human flaw being we will do more to avoid pain than we will to seek pleasure so how how important how important like do we do we need to feel pain and again that's relative to everyone it's very subjective what is painful um, does pain need to be felt for there to be growth change whether it's unbecoming or becoming how important is pain in your process with your clients and what you do or how important is pain in your life it'll depend once again on the, the client of course having ha, pain pain and pleasure is push pull that's, right. that's that's pain pain and pleasure so being clear on on what we're moving towards and, and what, we're, what we're gaining or the, the pleasure so to speak and what we're moving away from what that pain is um i would i would suggest that based on my research that we are successors of people that avoided pain not of necessarily um of people that that seeked pleasure now that doesn't mean that it's black and white. It was only one. I'm saying before technology, before homes, I'm not sure how much pleasure was being seek, but it was the avoidance of pain that, that allowed us to, to send up and run because we were hungry or whatever. I wasn't there. I'm simplifying it. I'm using the lens that I have today based upon the research I've gone through isn't extensive in that area. And so that's where it's, it's not about pain. Isn't a negative thing. Right. When we are able to actually go, I need to change this thing and I'm not sure how to change it. And then we have the ability to ourselves to be able to build up the pain and become aware of like, what happens if I don't change? Mm-hmm. I stay right here. What happens if I stay right here? Well, if I stay right here, then I've had this conversation with my spouse five times now. And I think that might break the relationship. What does that mean for you? It's like, fuck, I won't get to see the kids. I love my wife as well. I need all of a sudden these things that weren't online for me. That's not a right. bad thing at all. Mm-hmm. And we go shit. And so there's my perspective ultimately it's also going so if you would achieve that what would that be like for you and 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 what 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 state would that feel could you feel the wind on your face as you're sitting at the beach or whatever the case might be and so the the scope isn't to lean into one or the other or overvalue one or overvalue the other although it's really important to get clear on on where we're going 
otherwise you know it's like going, getting a menu and you're like oh, i don't mind right yeah, <laughs> just yeah, yeah. just just not the ribeye i just don't want the ribeye <laughs> whatever you do they bring out a fucking porterhouse or something like that right and you're like you're like i said no steak it's like you said no ribeye <laughs> so we have to get clear on exactly what we want and sometimes that's that's difficult and that's that's challenging for people especially if they've been hinging their life on other people's wants they struggle to put themselves first they're used to discounting of self um and and then we'll coach that is that what we're coaching to is that a pattern that's that's shown up for you and where else does it show up in your life Mm -hmm. and so that's where it, it really does um you know become really varied in in depending on the individual and how they're choosing to show up and what they're choosing to bring to the session um but then from there, it's the first step anyway, from, from any form of development is just an awareness. Break. If you're not aware, if it's not online, yeah. how are you meant to change it? Right. And I say changes it is in integrate it and, and, and move past it. Not as in get rid of that because it served you. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have developed that pattern. Yeah. You wouldn't have, you would not have had it around if it didn't serve you in some way or another small example. And so like I was speaking to someone about it with my dog today <laughs> And uh, when he was a puppy, um, he would, uh, he would, anything was a toy, right? So whatever was on the ground was a toy. He didn't shoot too many things up. However, he, um, he would get our socks because the socks is a small little thing that he right. put in his mouth. He's a mini schnauzer. I mean, like he's, he's eight kilos, maybe eight <laughs> and a half on a, on a good day. Right. So he was, he was small anyway. So after a while he realized that, I, I'm not allowed to grab socks. That's that's naughty or whatever the term might be. And then when he wasn't getting enough attention from us, he'll go get socks and he would bring it over. And the first couple of times I'm like, no, naughty. And then he would, every time he'd put his ears back and then he'd bring over this, like he'd put it right in front of us. He just wanted attention. Yeah. Right. He didn't actually verbalize that to me in English, <laughs> based on the behavior that I was reading. Yeah. And so, in the end, I ended up just picking up the socks and putting them back and ignoring him. Um, and then he stopped doing it. And so it was this thing for him is that that pattern that he was running was simply to seek a particular particular outcome, which was attention for him, significance maybe. Mm-hmm. And um, and funnily enough, the behavior changed because then I stopped getting him in trouble. I just put it away. And then he would come and sit next to me, lay down and he would get attention. Right. And and so he, does, he never gets socks anymore. Like it's just not a thing for him because he never got attention in the end. So we, we, we use that example for humans of like, why does that person play up in class? It's like, they're not getting attention at home, mate. Mind read, not for everyone. Right. But they're not getting attention there. So how the, like they need to feel like they're significant because because the, their lack of self-confidence is so low that they actually have to behave in a way that's not congruent with, with how the system wants them to behave for them mm-hmm. to get attention and feel significant and important. Because now you have absolutely have to give them your attention. That's so interesting. And it's so interesting the story that you just uh, shared. P- PD, right? PD. Yeah. It's because I, I, I'm i doing it. PD the philosopher on Instagram. Not yeah. There I, you I don't go. post. Gina, Gina <laughs> might post. P E A T Y. I love anyway. that. Um, because I'm reading right now about the, the ability, and maybe dogs can do this as well. I don't know. But the ability to change a pattern in your mind by literally like uh, just switching a belief and. For some reason, he was able to go, okay, I don't need the sock to facilitate me getting that outcome. So he shut that channel down, that sock channel, if you will, and then created this new like frequency to say, I can still get X by doing A, B, and C. Yes? Yeah. And we can do that as well. as, as You don't have to be eight kilos and called PD. <laughs> it helps, but yeah. So where, where do you sit on uh, beliefs? Like how important are beliefs to you? I was watching a podcast uh, with Dr. Joe Dispenza. I don't know if you've heard the name, but I just, I actually, I haven't shared this yet publicly, but I watched this podcast and listened to this podcast and I actually found myself incontrollably uh, weeping, not like sobbing, like tears everywhere, but I was actually crying just because of, what he was explaining to me and the beauty of and the power that they've now discovered. It's no longer a philosophy. It is a science. So how important are beliefs for you? And then how much are you sharing that with your clients, even in the gym as well? Like how, how important is someone to have the mindset or the belief that they can back squat 
500 or deadlift X or whatever it may be. Like how much of that is part of your program and your messaging to the people that you work with, the beliefs, that wiring? Um, I often use a different word for belief, uh, which is a frame. Um, so if you ever hear me use the word frame, I'm usually referring to belief. Got you. Um, and so the, the reason why I use that word, um, it's different to like, I wouldn't say just framing yourself. It's, it's believing yourself. I, I get that. <laughs> right. But more so when looking at the frames that person holds in mind and those frames create a structure and that's a, that's a, that's a thought structure or what I would be referring to as meta states, right? Which is a state on a state on a state and state being a mind, body, emotional, energetic field. And in order to have that state in the first place, we have to have a thought and we have a thought, then we have a feeling about that thought. Then we have a thought about that feeling and then a feeling about that thought. And all of a sudden the feeling and thoughts that the highest frames that govern the game, govern the way that you operate with the world, no longer actually have to do with what's in front of you, but what's in front of you triggered this, fr this, this meta state this form of, 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 of frames um, that you hold in mind to be true. And so we can call that belief, right? Um, a lot of the time they're unconscious people aren't aware of it until we ask questions um, from a place of curiosity not a, not a leading because if I ask leading questions then I'm asking questions based on where I want to take you which is no longer you right and so um, I, I may not use the language of beliefs or frames that much um, however that's a lot of the time that from the gym floor which is very different or not very different, but it is different. People come there to physically train mm -hmm. people, people engage me from a developmental standpoint to, to mentally um, right. gain change. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's no gaps in either one of them. Right. And so they overlap. Um, but I also know that I don't really have permission to excavate the person's mind in on the gym floor and they just, they just want to train right. and have the puppies right. and yeah. I can have an icy pole and off they go. <laughs> so, um, so in that circumstance, I still may ask questions, but what those questions are on behalf of is me doing my best to calibrate with the individual. And what I mean by calibrate is rather than they say something and I assume I know what they mean, I'll engage with that. It's like, a, you know, an example may be, um, I don't think I can do that. And I'll be like, okay, why is that? And they go, well, I've never done that before in the past. And rather than trying to get them to believe, right? It's not that. It's just like, okay, so so what would you like to get out of today then? And they go, well, I do want to do it. It's like, right, so you're willing to try. They're like, I'm willing to try. And it's like, so what do you need to do now to give yourself the best opportunity to get there? And so that way it's, it's and they're, they're telling me, not being like, so what do you need to do now? <laughs> right. to, it's like, so what is it that you need um, right. to be able to do that? And they might, they're coming up with the resources. This, they're not then building a reliance on me to be like, you can do it. Come on. I'm going to motivate right, you, right. but I'm actually creating a codependence because now you need me here, this external authority to tell you that you can do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm here with you, not for you. And so um, the, that person then has that opportunity in that moment to challenge the frames they hold in mind. And I don't, I don't care about, 500 pounds on the bar right if they do that's great what i care about is my clients coming back and saying because they were able to become aware of their sympathetic nervous system and how to use that sympathetic nervous system they started to become um, consciously argumentative with things that were important to them such as um, reviewing a contract for work and then negotiating higher pay terms right. and so when i have a female come back and say something like that that's what i want when i have a male come back and say that they actually relax because they understood that while they're on holidays, like your, your one hour in the gym should be positively impacting you 23 hours outside of that facility. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it's just for the numbers in the gym, then that gym owns you. The fitness industry owns you. It's using you. You should use the fitness industry to make sure you're getting more out of life. And so that's one of the key things there is that we want to help develop the whole person and, and we take a physical approach within the gym setting and, and more of a mental approach within all the stuff that I do. Yeah, and I love that too. And I... I... That's one of the reasons why I feel like I'm so drawn to uh, to connect with you, Dave, through uh, obviously through things like social media is because I feel like when you communicate, it comes from a true level of sincerity and like genuineness. And I'm also so intrigued by that, uh, the way you frame it in regards to how you look at your coaching and just listening to the way you articulate it. I, I can see how through some of the work that I do with my clients is 
and even my relationships as well is creating this codependence. And then I ask myself, okay, why is that? Do I need to feel a certain, or, or do I desire to feel uh, wanted or needed? So that for me is such a, uh, that the language that you use or that you say that you use with your clients, whether in the gym or outside really is allowing you to become, and this is me uh, putting words in your mouth here. So feel free to interject is allowing you for, is allowing you to become part of me at some point redundant to them. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. To, to some degree for sure. And when I say to some degree is in, is it doesn't come a point where I'm like, fuck off, just go away. <laughs> like, yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's obviously it's not that um, we, we, we create an environment uh, and a culture um, that's, that's, Um, the, the words escape me will come to me later on, but right. basically that supports growth for, for the individuals as they are. Mm -hmm. So the person, the idea is to get the person, um, you know, if they enjoy that, then they'll stick around. If they, they'll do that for a period of time, that's fantastic. At some point they'll move on and we, we, we get that and understand that. But, um, the, the key thing is to get our clients not to need us. Yeah. Right? Which because is, which what happens is just, just sorry on that quickly, what happens yeah. though, and this is something that I learned in the fitness industry very early on before I was one of the reasons why I started Funk functional fitness Australia, which was because the fitness industry creates these long-term psychological issues, provides people with, 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 with short-term physical solutions to create repeat customers. And I realized that I was constantly here just telling people how to lose weight, pushing them through their workouts and, and, and telling them, um, calling them up when they didn't show up and getting them in trouble or punishing them, all this kind of bullshit. Right. And I think that was a necessary stage for myself and probably for a lot of other people to work through. But I guess the point where you realize that I'm only pretending to solve the solutions that I'm um, pretending to solve the problems that I'm actually perpetrating. And yeah. so it, that the person would always return to default. People don't yo-yo. They, they don't yo-yo. They, they peak and they return to wherever their gravitational pull is their default. And if, if they're peaking because um, of accountability to me, mm -hmm. then it's just an expensive six months. Yeah. And as, as you describe that, it reminds me of, and you've shared this multiple times on mood prep. And I think I actually heard you uh, share it on your latest podcast. I could be, mis I could be misspeaking here, but uh, that idea of we don't, we don't rise to the occasion. We fall to our training. Absolutely. Right? So the, the way I interpret what you said is like my clients shouldn't need me to be behind them yelling at them to demand more in this contract or yelling at them to, to get under that barbell and stand it up, whatever it is. Like they should be able to, you should be giving them the tools as your, as their coach that they're able to do it independent of you. Yeah. And there's a big part of it where, um, having the, the perspective of like everything is useful. There was definitely a moment in time where it's useful for me to get behind someone and be like that. And it's very important for me to have access to that. Consciously choosing who and when and why I'm doing that becomes really, really important. Um, and so I've got clients that I've had for, for years and years and they might have a competition coming up, right? And so before that competition, I'll fucking look them dead stare in the eye and, and ex explain. And that will be this different experience, right? Right, right. I might grab them by the shirt. And I'll pull them in close. Like it could be completely different, but it's on behalf of them finding out their potential. And right. so I would, there's no way that I would do that with, you know, a 45 year old woman <laughs> on a <her> third <laughs> session. Just like you listen here, Clarice, right? Clarice, right? I love you, it. You pick up that barbell like a 45 year old woman. I wouldn't, wouldn't do that, you know? So, but in the same time, and this is my conversation I had with a, with a person that was inquiring yesterday. She wants to do PT. Um, and I said, oh, Gina or, or Megan, two of our uh, uh, lovely coaches, probably be the person to speak to. Happy to organize for you to come and have a chat with them. Um, and she sort of goes, okay. And she brought up a slight concern, um, whether that was because of the, the names of female or just in general, I'm not too sure. And right. she's like, oh, she previously, she's worked really, really well off having um, people that were um, sort of more like really firm and don't take, don't take bullshit basically. And I was like, okay, I go, look, uh, let, me, let me explain our sort of overarching philosophy or, or methodology um, in, in short. And we've got an intro on Thursday night. I'd invite you into that. It's free, no obligations. Find out a bit more about why we do what we do and how it all works and pieces together. But the key thing for us is that we're not there for clients, we're there with them. 
And so um, that bleeds into all of our coaches and it definitely stems from me because I was a person that started this business 10 years ago. Let me explain it this way. I'm not going to push you through anything, but I will absolutely challenge you to find out what your potential is. And I'll be there with you as you unfold, no matter how messy it is so that you can get there. Right. But that's on you. So, but if I push you, then you become reliant on me and therefore um, your results are because of me. And therefore your, your failures are because of me and, and you own nothing of it. So it, it, the, the flip of that is that I'm more than happy to challenge with you because that, that's where growth is. And yeah, um, yeah, I love that, man. That's, but it's so counterintuitive. I feel to what we've been told and taught about coaching. It's like, it, you don't, you don't, I use the word redundant, but you, you want to be needed. You want to be, you want your clients to need you because if they don't, then, you know, who's going to be You've there. Done your job. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah, Look, I, I, people. <laughs> I want to respect your time. Honestly, man, there's like 47 different things I wanted to cover, but before I do let you go officially, I wanted to promote, uh, the book minding yourself. This is, I'll admit, um, Lindsay, my partner has become like your biggest, uh, fan since I told her like, check out your podcast. So, uh, she's super excited that I had the opportunity to talk with you tonight. And I opened this up, um, stole it from her for the evening. And I wanted to quickly just read a quick paragraph if you're open to it and then yeah, have you just kind it. of, uh, share a bit. Cause I really think this is really powerful and it, it may be like overarching of what we touched on so far. So it's page 153 and it says, maybe we identify as a coach or a salesperson or even a mother. None of these are actually true. They are all things we do. They are not us. Maybe we identify as fat, as uncoordinated or as weird. These are also not true. We aren't fat. We have fat. We also have fingernails. You are not a fingernail. Identifying as uncoordinated will keep you uncoordinated and thinking that you're weird will help ensure that you do things that align with the belief or frame, if you will, so that everything is right in the world. When we all know that secretly you like being weird. So in short, for us to become who we truly, truly are, we must first unbecome who we are not. That for me, again, is like the, the unbecoming who we are not is such a powerful statement and powerful share but i feel like a lot of the people listening to this podcast people listen to your podcast identify with things like i have anxiety or i am overweight or i am an alcoholic and a paragraph like that really challenges that and and it's it just challenges people's um i guess using that as a i don't want to say as a crutch but what was your motivation in sharing that sentence and what, or sorry, sharing that paragraph and where does that come from? Is that from just studies that you've done as a personal experience? Like the fact that we're not our fingernails, you're not a fingernail, like you have them, but you're not them. Where does that all come from? Um, I mean, that quote came from, I, I would have seen that, that particular quote like eight years ago. I was saying, I do remember when I first read it and I was like, ha, it's quite <laughs> funny. I have no idea where it came from. Right, it was right. just, it was just so blunt and yeah. playful. Right. And so yeah. at the core of a lot of the way that I communicate is quite playful and you'll often find that there's a playfulness to it. And then I'll speak straight to the actual core. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that, which I won't, I don't need to get into, but, but that's really important as well. Yet when we're able to see the identity that we have been identifying as, and then seeing how that's serving us uh, and seeing if it's still serving us, and then it's not about necessarily changing the identity of going, well, I am, you know, I'm not a bad mom. I'm a good mom. It's like, if that's what you want, Mm -hmm. or you know you're 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 a, you're a human being that's experiencing this world as you are and you have an opportunity here to to continually improve on these areas that where, where you want to improve so that you can show up for your children as best you can whether that you're a good mom is bad mom is subjective it goes similar to the point when i speak to young trainers and i'm like don't be concerned about being a good trainer don't don't focus on don't worry about that be concerned or, or, or become interested and curious about being an experienced trainer because being good is going to be subjective to someone. You're going to be good to someone. You're going to be bad. But if you continually look to seek to 
gain experience by by interacting with experience you'll become more useful than ever if you were good or bad mm -hmm. and so when we move past this identity of 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 how other people may see us or where we think we place in the world some people struggle with it but but losing that identity is not about um losing yourself it's actually finding yourself mm -hmm. and so the there's a beautiful book of it it is it is it is quite dense, but it's a beautiful book called Pearl Beyond Price by A.H. Almas. And uh, he, he talks a lot about what's called object relations, but he also talks a lot about um, personal essence. And personal essence is the integration of personality into being. And so being is the observing. It's, it's the true um, unfiltered version of us, not our structures of us, just the witness if you want to call it something but once we call it something we're no longer the witness mm -hmm. but but it's then it's when when we see these parts of us that we we have held on to for so long uh and that that are parts of our personality structures it's not about being void of that right when someone's like oh i've it's just got no ego it's like do you are you aware that's the ego telling you that like, it's not the ego isn't bad. It's actually the integration of egoic structures, which are personality structures that, that brings us home to our personal essence. So we can be here in the present moment mm -hmm. as we are with an integration of all of what we've experienced from, from day dot to now. And, and the longer we hold on to these identity structures of how and who we're meant to be, the, the longer we, we wait to return home. Hmm. Powerful dude. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that book. Thank you so much for penning it and for uh, sharing it with uh, people like Lindsay and others around the world. Uh, before I officially let you go, I do want to give you kind of like a red carpet opportunity. Uh, the podcast has changed names. The format is still the same. Yes. No. That's, that's correct. Yeah. So the new podcast is called Alpha Theta. And can you just give me an idea and listeners idea of what motivated the name change and the concept? Yeah. Yep. So, um, with a couple other, so alpha theta is, is a, is a business of mine, which is a, a development from all the coaching and, and the programs, seminars and, and week workshops and all that stuff that I've done and run in the past. And so we wanted to move that away from just Dave Nix running a seminar to building that into a, a proper business model with proper modules for people to be able to follow over what be it six weeks to, to 24 months. And so um, we came up with the, with like, what is it that we're actually doing? And one of the core things is allowing people to have the best opportunity to experience flow, which really is pointing at fulfillment and presencing um, in any given moment. And um, whether that's, that's a mum at home or whether that's a dad at home, right or whether that's playing sport and so i've worked with a variety of different people and, and and what the commonality was was this person um seeking fulfillment continually and, and knowing how to get there and, and what that is like for them and so alpha theta is in reference to brain waves and so it's been observed that when someone's in a state of flow their brain waves balance between alpha and theta and so that's where um the podcast itself like as you mentioned it's called the alpha theta flow um we have I put up five podcasts a week, about seven minutes, give or take a couple. Um, but you'll find out more about Alpha Theta at um, alphathetaflow.com uh, awesome. where all the services and products and, and more content for myself. But there is 600 and there's actually more because I did about 30 episodes of musings, which back in the day I haven't done for a couple of years, but I would interview people and talk about all sorts of stuff. But there's about 630 um podcasts up for mood prep and, and musings so let alone yeah. um other bits of content that i put out so yeah well, I, I can say on behalf of myself and everyone else especially Lindsay, as she goes for her runs at uh, 5 a.m in the morning we really appreciate all the content that you share and as someone who has a podcast i know that it isn't the easiest thing to do so the fact that you're now pushing uh above six close to the 700s is just incredible so thank you so much for sharing it it means a lot to me and everyone else that follows you so thank you to yeah, my pleasure, man. I re really appreciate that. And it's it's lovely to be able to, to I spent a fair bit of time in America, but it's lovely to have people around the world reach out and chat with them. It's, um, it's a beautiful and unique experience and I'm very grateful for it. Yeah, no, I think it's a, uh, and again, you talk about this as, as well, um, about now being like the most beautiful, awesome time. And we are sure we have our issues, especially now globally, but 
uh, I, I'm a firm believer that this is like the time to be alive. The fact that we can be doing this right now with these two microphones and the fact that I know about, uh, you know, a particle about you, you know, a particle about me because of things like social media and podcasts is just super rad. Um, so guys, if you, if you don't currently follow Dave on social media, Dave, it's whiskey weights and wisdom still. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. On Instagram. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the place for now. I'll keep it okay. there for now. At some point it'll probably change, but okay. And it's then fitting. the new, the new podcast is alpha theta flow available on all platforms. Uh, I assume so. Um, okay. for, to if my not, knowledge, <laughs> it's, it should if, be. Yeah. yeah it, sh- it should be as it is. If it isn't, um, iTunes definitely has it. And yeah, the book "Minding Yourself" is available. I've heard you say uh, in all bookstores online. You can also order it from your website, which is davenixon dot com. So you might be able to still order it from there, but you can definitely get it from alphatheaflow.com. Okay, got you. So um, the probably from both, but alphatheaflow.com. You can buy it from there, and, and um, I don't. I'm not sure if it's. I can't promise that it's in bookstores in, in your local area, but it's definitely online. So even yeah, before we, I got mine here in Koala Island, <laughs> I um I had to I had to order like heaps from the book depository. So I was paying 25 bucks a book for my own book. It's quite funny. Yeah. So no, we we like how much? I'm like 25 dollars. <laughs> just dollar for dollar. I don't, just take it, read it. Good yeah, rates, no, five we, stars. If you're in, if you're in Canada, guys, you're listening. Uh, Amazon was our friend with the. Uh, dave's book but i've heard you say as well if you want a signed copy you can buy it from alpha theta flow.com correct yeah i'll put a little love note in there for you awesome um before i officially let you go i just want to say thank you dude so much for one taking time i'm a firm believer that time is the most valuable thing that we have so from the bottom of my heart thank you for giving me the last uh hour and six minutes of your time to me and the listeners thank you so much and i also just want to say thank you dude for always being open to giving me time and space uh you don't know me from adam but uh i've reached out to you multiple times and you've always made space for me and i appreciate that more than you know and i will forever support you and what you're doing whether it's books or podcasts or programs um i'm a big fan and believe in what you're doing keep doing it and and thank you again from the bottom of my heart i really appreciate it my pleasure man it's been great catching up thank you yeah so guys if you want to check more uh out in regards to dave check him out online instagram you have his website i'll put all the links in his show notes and you guys know what to do until next time be good and do good that's it we did it dude easy thanks my man